Episode 7 was quite intense at times. It was criticized that Rings of Power lacks a bit of stakes. This episode, in my opinion, countered that a bit. In a way it's a curse of prequel shows that you know which characters won't see severe consequences. I guess due to the Rings of Power often contradicting the book law, it still has an unpredictability and the makers are willing to play with this at times. In a way I think they won't change too much at the end, but the strange, savage for a lack of a better word nature of the show might help a bit in this regard, though some of it is still vague enough that the show can return to what we know from the books to some degree. I can already spoil here, I mostly liked the episode, but some concerns and some ideas I didn't like were there as well. I'm Chris aka The Philosopher's Games and we will dive into episode 7 of The Rings of Power season 1 today. I look into some details you might have missed and of course we also look into some book related things. I even could translate most of what the stranger said. As always shout outs to the artists who allowed me to use their fantastic artworks and spoiler warning. I assume you have seen all 7 episodes so far and have at least seen The Lord of the Rings. The episode starts where the last one ended. Orodruin is Sindarin and means fiery mountain. Later the Numenorians name it Mount Doom or Amon Amars, which is the Sindarin translation of it. This volcano broke out and transformed the Southlands into the hellish wasteland we know from the Lord of the Rings. It becomes Mordor. From the book's perspective, it is not clear if this land was ever called not Mordor in the Second Age, which is also Sindarin and means Black Land. We can read in Peoples of Middle-earth about the early Second Age in one of Tolkien's very late writings. No doubt because Gil-galad had by then discovered that Sauron was busy in Eregion, but had secretly begun the making of a stronghold in Mordor. Maybe already an elvish name for that region because of its volcano Orodruin and its eruptions, which were not made by Sauron but were a relic of the devastating works of Melkor in the Long First Age. This reads a bit like that it was named Mordor before Sauron got there. Still I think it is an interesting thought to see the transformation of the Southlands though. So I don't mind what the show is doing. The term Southlands for it might be derived from the Silmarillion in this context. I even think the payoff is quite strong in episode 7. We see now the destruction and everything covered in ashes. The sun is blocked. Seeing Galadriel rising from the ashes really reminded me of a battle from the first age. The battle of sudden flame or Dagor Bragolach, where Morgoth unleashed fire, orcs, balrogs and dragons upon the elves besieging him in his fortress Angband, turning the war around. After this battle the elves started losing. In this episode called The Eye, Galadriel later talks to Theo and mentions that she lost her brother Finrod. In the books she lost two more brothers, Angrod, which is in one quite accepted version Gil-galad's grandfather and Aignor, who also loved a mortal woman named Andres. Here it became noticeable that they probably don't have the rights for the Silmarillion because those brothers are not mentioned in The Lord of the Rings while her oldest brother Finrod is. When I have to criticize something about the section in burning Tyr Harad, it would be that we see some people burning even a poor horse, but all the characters with names and the orcs are completely fine, so the fire of the pyroclastic flow was very selective on who was getting burned and who not, which again felt a bit like an invisible hand of the writers protecting people aka plot armor. Though in these scenes we also get to see some consequences to characters. Isildur's friend Ontamo did not survive. I have to admit I started to like him but of course he was a candidate for dying from a writing perspective. He did not want to be there in this war and was looking forward going home, so quite tragic. Some moments later we see Isildur getting buried in that collapsing house, which is a big shock because we know from the books the character will survive the second age. We see him in the Lord of the Rings prologue. I hope 
he is not getting the Peter Jackson Anarion treatment and is replaced by his brother this time, though I imagine we see something similar to that scene in Two Towers with Aragorn and his horse Brego, because we later see Elendi letting Berek leave and he runs straight back. The death scene was also a bit too sudden for a main character, with very little setup early in the episode, so I assume the orcs maybe find him or he escapes wounded and is picked up by his hoofed friend. If this should be true, I hope nothing will happen to Berek. Another severe consequence is that Miriel loses her eyesight, it seems, when she helps Isildur rescuing some villagers from a burning house. It's hinted at that the slowly collapsing house blinded her and we see her holding her eyes in this scene. Her becoming blind is not mentioned in the books, but I feel it's working well as a consequence. The prophetic warning of her father also gets a new meaning in this context when he says that only darkness awaits her in Middle-earth, quite literally besides the darkness of the events and the ashes blocking the sun she also can't see anymore. She further vows to come back and says that Galadriel should save her pity for the enemy because Numinor will return and knowing the books she might be right. She also calls her father Ar in Ziladun, which is his Adunaik name. Adunaik is the Menish language of Numinor. His faithful elvish name is Tar Palantir. At some point the not faithful kings abandoned naming themselves in Quenya, but chose Adunaik names to express them leaving the path of elven friendship and faithfulness to the Valar, the High Angels. This might be her motive to maybe become less faithful in the future or at least get to a more twisted point, though it seems she is still willing to work together with the elves. This is in my opinion a very interesting development and she calls herself Miri and not Zimrafel, her Adunaik name, so I can see that she might be conflicted, pretty cool scene. Next we jump to the Harfords. When the house collapses above Isildur, we go from fire to water in the next scene, which was in my opinion a pretty nice cut, also complete contrast because we hear Poppy sing. I have to admit I really like the Harford section again. They reach the grove and the fires of Orodrin also reached this place, so it must be relatively close to it, which seems strange. The Ash Mountains in the north are around 50 miles away from Orodrin already, so the rocks had to fly far to hit the grove. It seems it burned some of the trees there, which saddens the hobbits. The place might feel a bit small to be honest, because there should be more trees and things for the hobbits to eat besides those few apple trees. It's interesting that the Harfords seem to have warmed up a bit towards the stranger after he helped against the wolves. Especially Sardok even goes to ask him for help while now Nori is reluctant I guess due to the ice incident and Poppy covers her when she does not want to ask herself. Sardok also mentions that according to his great grandfather the mountains in the south could spit fire rocks so it seems Orodrin had spit fire before hundreds of years ago and he adds that it signals the rise of evil. This also makes it clear that the timelines happen in parallel. The stranger then attempts to help the Harfords. I could mostly understand what he says. He speaks Quenya again. He starts with Akuita, which means live. The A signals the imperative. Same with the next line, A in Vinyata, which means heal. We heard that last time as well in the ice scene. Then he says Lotena, which could mean be flower, also imperative of to be I think, maybe one could translate it with bloom. I guess it could also mean towards flower, so heal towards flower, but that goes again in the direction of bloom. Sadok says to Malva during this scene that some trees do talk, so he references ants, which we have seen already. I found his wording little words so trees understand it very cute. Then the stranger says something not shown in the subtitles anymore. I understood Tule Kuivjena. Tule is a causative form of to come I think and Kuivje means awakening or life. So life or awakening to come in the context as from the stranger to the tree I think. Then he says Envinata which means to heal. 
it's mentioned in the context of Arda healed in Morgoth's ring, which is interesting if we connect it to the scene. In this essay Tolkien discussed Arda, so the world itself, being marred, which means Morgoth infusing Arda with his evil power damaging it. To undo the damage it must be undone by Eru, that is God, and rebuilt anew, which is then called Arda healed, Envinyanta, which is different from Arda unmarred. I hear no imperative R here, so it maybe connects to what he said before, life awakening to come to heal. Then he continues with Lotena and again maybe Envinata in the background while Lago talks and finally the stranger repeats Aquita again. Kuivienen is also the name of the bay where the elves awoke and it means water of awakening in case people wonder. So if he is a wizard my bet is still on Gandalf or maybe Radagast since he seems to be worried about the trees. The men in the moon theory is also still possible. However, the stranger is again a bit clumsy and Nori's sister Dilly gets almost hit by the crashing parts of the tree, which frightens the Halfwoods again. In a way it's their fault for not keeping their distance and I think the I assume not evil nature of the stranger and Nori jumping at her sister to save her might have prevented the worst. It also seems as if the stranger's word of command, a term we find in Lord of the Rings, did not work, but we see a little bit of green growing out of the tree, which is unnoticed by Sadok. I saw the film trope of him moving away and then suddenly turning around for no reason coming, but it did not happen and the Harfoots are surprised next day that the trees started to bloom again. I appreciate not using the trope. Sadok also explains to the stranger how he gets to Greenwood the Great, which is the wood that later will become known as Mirkwood, and he seems to know that Big Folk is there. He also gives him the piece of paper with the star constellation on it and explains that it has not been seen for over a thousand years by the Harfords. I like that he says in parts unknown, because that sounds like it was in the late first age and we know nothing about the hobbits of that time, only that they existed somewhere. If it was after the defeat of Morgos, maybe it was a sign of victory, maybe it really is supposed to be Valakirka, the sickle of the Valar, inspired by the Big Dipper, also known as the Plough, which has a special meaning. It was set to challenge Morgos, I assume by Varda, the high angel of the stars and it's what Bilbo and Frodo later see on their journeys. One could argue maybe Durin the first saw it above his head as a crown in his own reflection in the lake Miramar, where he then founded Casa Doom and it maybe looks a bit like a crown. Though Valakirka consists of only seven stars, not ten. There's also the related constellation called Minelmarkar, Swordsman of the Sky, which is inspired by Orion. It looks distantly similar and consists of at least eight bright stars. I really liked those scenes, they were filled with interesting details and the actors sell the scenes well, especially Daniel Wayman playing the stranger who seems really sad about what happened, but he will leave the Harfoots and Nori gifts him a red apple. Another interesting detail, Amazon writes about the grove that they were gardens of men once. One might connect that to what we know about the Entwives who went east and taught men and maybe hobbits agriculture at some point. Quite interesting. The next scene I also quite liked. Marigold talks to Nori and I think she struggles a bit seeing how Nori kind of lost her curious rebellious nature a bit. I think she might have been similar when she was young. When we come back to the Harfoots we also see the three female cultists in the credits named as the Dweller, the Nomad and the Aesthetic. They really seem to be able to teleport or move unseen for a moment. Nazgirls is maybe quite fitting. Interestingly Poppy does something similar when she sees another big footprint that fits the description of the hobbits to be able to get away unseen in need. We learn that the cultists search for the stranger and not the hobbits, but we also learn that they are not nice when they burn the cards. The dweller aka Feminem seems to be able to absorb fire as the stranger but also set things on fire. Fittingly her hands are always covered in soot. 
When the Hafid's carts burn down, this might lead to them having to find a new way of living, leaving their endless wandering. We learned that they always wandered on a big circle. Maybe they have to leave their old lifestyle behind now. It's also remarkable that Nori knows no fear and talks to them, trying to lead them into the wrong direction. Strangely, the dweller takes the flower in Nori's hair, which might be a leftover of the flowers she suddenly wears at the beginning of episode 5. Then Feminem also picks the flower that grew out of the apple tree after the stranger healed it and the nomad then knows where to go. Very mysterious. They kind of like picking flowers it seems and definitely have some magical powers. However, at the end the Harfoots decide to go after the stranger. Even Malva is now on his side and admits that she was wrong. So quite a lot of character development here. Distantly reminiscent of Lobelia Sequel Baggins' redemption arc in the Lord of the Rings books, though that was far more tragic compared to the show. It's maybe not the most original little story we see here, but for me it worked and I enjoyed seeing the actors. I also liked how Lago cheers up Nori and the others. Some lines are quite cheesy though. After that, the Harfords seem to change things. Nori gets her rebellious nature back and Poppy of course comes with her and says we left enough folk behind. Maybe a bit much development in such a short time, but it worked for me. Next, I would move back to Galadriel for a moment. One of the big controversial lore topics of this episode might also be that Galadriel talks about her husband Kiliborn and that he went to war but she never saw him again. If he would be dead, that would be terrible in my opinion, but the wording at least leaves the chance of him still being alive and appear at some point. Him disappearing is of course not mentioned in the books, though there were times in some versions Tolkien wrote where Galadriel and Kiliborn did not see each other for some time in the Second Age and had to live at different places. So maybe they reference that and build it up a bit more. Maybe also to make Kiliborn a more interesting character for the show. Who knows? I would not write him off. Same with Isildur. Her character can be understood a bit better after this loss though, but I can't see him being killed off screen. A scene like this would be too relevant though maybe we see a later flashback. In a worst case scenario he was captured by Sauron or something like this. There must be a good reason he was gone for over 1000 years and I can't come up with one except being imprisoned, hiding or chasing down something mirroring Galadriel. He could also have been re-embodied and sent back to Middle-earth, taking Glorfindel's role, which I would not like. It would also be strange if this was a different timeline from the Lord of the Rings. Galadriel also tells Theo how she and Kiliborn met, which seems like a Beren and Luthien reference, which I liked. Besides that I also think the dialogue between Galadriel and Theo was pretty decent. The boy struggles with guilt and anger. He is very similar to pre-Numinor Galadriel in the show in that regard, but now she has learned and developed and says something very important in context of Tolkien's universe, which might seem cheesy. There are always greater powers of good at work, but sometimes their design is not clear. I feel like Galadriel just realized this in that dialogue herself or maybe shortly before. I feel she definitely grew as character and she could maybe tell Theo some things she learned herself recently. I like the line, don't take the burden of this day upon your shoulders. You might find it difficult to put down again. She knows that very well. Also some lines we have heard before. She says to Theo, it is over, same as Elrond said to her. Now she has to be the voice of reason and it seems she grew as a leader, though she thinks what happened is her fault. Another interesting insight that maybe grew in Galadriel's mind is that she does not see killing orcs as good deed and disagrees with Theo. One can argue that a moment ago she wanted to kill every orc possible and Adar last, but she now has maybe realized that she went far off the path of wisdom and mercy. That's maybe a bit too fast on the development side, but it's also about time, so I don't mind. Walking with Theo maybe helps her to 
to reflect on herself as well and she maybe tries to prevent him from going to these dark places inside his heart and get lost there like her for some time. It almost seems like therapy for her too. In the camp we see consequences of the battle. Of course, all bigger characters are not really hurt besides the mentioned Miriel. Interestingly, I think the camp is where Minas Ithil is later founded by Isildur in the books. East of Minas Anor or Minas Tirith as it's later called. It will become Minas Morgul in mid-third age. Elendil struggles a lot with the potential death of his son and emotionally makes Galadriel responsible, which she also agrees with, I guess. When Miriel vows to return, he might see it as curse. I really like Miriel in this scene. We also see Halbrand was wounded and that he needs elvish treatment. So Galadriel suggests to write back to her king. In case people wonder, just to get to Eregion's capital from this location, if we consider it is where Minas Ithil will be founded, it's about 800 to 850 miles to ride. To Lindon, it would be about 1100 to 1200 miles. You want to ride that with somebody heavily wounded. That is again one of these strange writing decisions that we have seen in every episode so far. However, with Halbrand going to potentially Eregion or Lindon, I can see a certain theory becoming more and more likely, I have to admit. Not sure if I'm a fan of that to be honest. That Halbrand knows smithing and him now riding to the elves and potentially Eregion is just too convenient. Also, if he survives this journey, he might not be human. Maybe somebody took his place during the Mount Doom incident? Also, Bronwyn talks about going to a Numenorian settlement called Pilar Gear with her people. It's a faithful settlement and as mentioned in my episode 6 review and analysis video, it was written on Miriel's map in the Adonaic script invented for the show, which I could read. So if they go there, Pilar Gear might become a location of importance next season, which would be pretty cool though, there might be a chance of them not reaching this place. In this context, if they don't go to the White Mountains, that might also rule out Halbrand is the king of the Oathbreakers theory, which seemed very plausible as well. Last, I want to briefly talk about the Elrond, Disa and Durin section. It was again fun watching them, but it really seems that the decay is reversed by the light of Mithril, which hints at the weird story being true. I expressed already in the episode 5 review that I'm not a fan of that at all. Still, besides that, this section had some fantastic scenes again. Durin the third was really shining in this section and the irony is that in a way he is right. The show even hints at this by briefly showing Durin's Bane. My trailer analysis theory was also almost correct regarding the Balrog scene. Still, I think Mithril is quite important for Khazad Doom and it takes thousands of years before it will fall. They will also dig for it at some point. King Durin can't stop that. Also, by letting the elves theoretically leave Middle-earth early, he would also potentially doom Middle-earth as well by making it easier for Sauron. So, in a way, he's absolutely not right. It's interesting to see these scenes knowing what will happen much later. Not sure where this will lead though. Durin's Bane is a topic of the Third Age, not the Second. Maybe the Balrog just moves a bit to hide deeper in the mountains for now, so the dwarves can mine there later. King Durin the Third also takes away his son's gorget. It has Durin Deathless written on it. Some speculate that Prince Durin's true name is Narvi in the show, but that would be strange because it's a Manish name, not a Kuzdul one. Narvi was the legendary dwarven smith of the Second Age who made the doors of Durin with Celebrimbor. For it, they needed Mithril though. Very hard to predict where this will lead to. We learn that Prince Durin has a brother and maybe the prince was disinherited by his father. So for sure it would be possible that the brother becomes the next king and 
reference Durin becomes Narvi, but I would find that strange as well. We will see. I can see that the dwarves get a ring of power and then start mining Mithril as well and that those rings might save the elves, so the urgency to make those rings is higher now without much Mithril available. I have to say I'm curious where the last episode will go. Overall I liked this episode and in my opinion it was again pretty solid. I still think Rings of Power is so far not really a good Tolkien adaption but it can be enjoyable as fantasy show with Tolkien elements in it. Sadly it is hit and miss at times. For me the episodes hit a bit better recently but I can see that this won't be the same for everyone. Especially if people are annoyed by the strange lore changes that also sometimes feel unnecessary necessary like changing Gil-galad so much or the strange writing decisions like letting a heavily wounded man ride on a horse for over 800 miles. The show is often bad at distances, size and time. That has not changed. The text changing from Southlands to Mordor at the end was also an unusual choice. I think if Adar would have simply said Mordor it would have worked better. It's always these little details that add up. Still I have to admit that things got better and I'm curious where this will end. It helps that I like Galadriel again in this episode. The actress does a very good job and as said the character makes more sense now in my opinion. Of course she is very different from what I imagined from the books but I said this by now a million times. Still I feel the final episode will decide quite a bit about the perception of season 1. Will they be able to bring the decent and the nonsense elements of the show to a satisfying season end? I'm not sure. I'm curious how the story will be continued and I'm somewhat hooked. In my opinion I found episode 7 quite intense at times though the pacing was again slower but at least it did not feel rushed as for example episode 4. And quite a few things happened as well in this episode that might move the main plot further. One could say the episode was a bit lost dealing with the consequences of episode 6 but it felt necessary for me. For me the positives slightly outweigh the negatives resulting in a decent episode again. But let's be clear here it's not 10 out of 10 material, not even close and that is in context of the show again not ideal. Sometimes they can't tell the story straight forward, sometimes they rely too heavily on classic tropes that don't feel too elegant and you often get the feeling of an invisible hand of the writers pushing characters around when they need it or space and time. But sometimes what they write is pretty good in contrast. Let's hope next week all makes sense. Fingers crossed. Thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed the review and analysis. If so subscribe, like and maybe leave a comment. How did you like episode 7? I can see it being received mixed again. If you want to learn more about the book's law, check my channel. I have some very detailed videos about Elrond, the elves, Galadriel, Sauron, Mount Doom and the Misty Mountains and even Tolkien's languages. Also maybe recommend me to other fans of Tolkien. Next will be some streams and watch parties on YouTube and Twitch for episode 7, hopefully another roundtable stream with some other Tolkien creators and I might finally make the German Rings of Power review video I wanted to make. So if you speak German feel free to check out the German channel as well. Can't believe that we only have one episode left and then season 2 will maybe come in 2 years or so. Though I have to admit I'm looking forward to produce book lore content again as well. Again thank you for watching and goodbye.